Hey, everybody. Okay, I got my custom-sized podium here. We had to move out. This, I just want to bring this wherever I go. Because if you don't know me, if you can't tell, five feet tall. But, you know, tiny but mighty. That's what I like to say. <laughs> trying to, yeah, trying to get a little tinier, but whatever. Um, but it is so awesome to be here and be with you all. There's um, some faces I know and some I don't. And I've been excited to get to know the churches of Newcastle and Gold Coast. I've been, I've been hiding away in New Zealand for the last 10 years far from Australia, especially through COVID, felt like it was very far. Um, and I haven't had a chance to get to know you until now. So if you don't know uh, me, we moved from New Zealand about eight months ago to Sydney uh, and have been leading the Auckland Church the last 10 years. And it was just an incredible time for us. Uh, but I grew up in Sydney. I was born in America, grew up in Sydney lived in America again, and then New Zealand 10 years. So I don't know where I'm from, but I like to claim the spa region as my home. But really, wherever I am in the world, the church is my home. I know you feel like that too, wherever you go, right? You just feel at home. So um, I love the theme of this conference too, Kingdom Builders. Yeah. And I was given the topic of fireproof relationships. What a cool title, right? Fireproof. Um, it's, it's from the, okay, this is not connected to that. I got to remember that. Okay. It's from the theme scripture they read last night. And I think we'll be hearing through the weekend, but this verse, particularly if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Wow. So building with costly stones. So I'd like to apply this verse into how to build our relationships using costly stones, using things that will last and not just in this world, but into eternity. And when you think about something being fireproof, it's actually quite amazing. People study it. You know, how do we make things fireproof? Uh, I was researching um, animals that have adapted to fire. And Australia is no stranger to fire. And what is so amazing, it's made um, research all over the world, is the echidna. Do you guys know this? Okay, some of you know it. Preaching to the choir here. Yeah, I didn't know this. After the Wamboral fires, all these, you know, animals died, but the echidnas didn't. So what they did is strap little sensors on their spines and set another fire, <laughs> hopefully controlled, and like tested it out. And what they have learned to do is find holes or dig holes, and then they go to sleep, and then they lower their body temperature as low as it can go so they can survive. And they just sleep through the fire. And then they keep sleeping until um, the uh, like bugs come back that they eat. Because when they wake up, if they wake up, uh, I guess, you know, all the bugs have died too. So it takes a little while, but they can sustain themselves to then. So then the echidnas keep going. Like, look at that, man. Fire has put these animals to the test. And some don't make it and some survive. <laughs> Um, and so in this idea of being fireproof, it gives us this question, how can we adapt to fires in our lives? How can our relationships be so strong that can get us through the fires together? It takes adaption, doesn't it? Well, of course, thinking through relationships that live through the fire, of course, I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I just found out yesterday the Newcastle Church has been studying the book of Daniel. So this is great. You've probably heard it recently and it's giving you a lot of context, but hopefully there's some new insights here. Um, but four friends in the book of Daniel is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they had fireproof relationships physically and spiritually. And a little bit of context, we're not going to, you kind of have to read the whole book of Daniel to get the big picture. So uh, we are going to read uh, one big section, but um, it, because we, can't, we don't have time to read the whole thing, I do encourage you 
to go and refresh or read it if you haven't. But some context, these guys, so the exile happened, right? Uh, the, the Jews disobeyed God for years and years and years until he's like, right, punishment. 70 years, you're banished to Babylon. So these guys would have been in that exodus uh, to Babylon. But then the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, chooses for some of them the, the cream of the crop and brings them into his um, authority and his uh, service. So these guys were chosen for that. But they didn't want to lose their faith. They didn't want to lose their identity as Jews and who they were in God. So they banded together to remain faithful to God. And so what we're going to do today is look at three ways they, they did this to be able to make their relationships fireproof. The three ways are prayer, courage, and faith. So let's talk about the prayer life. If you look in Daniel, if you turn with me to Daniel, chapter 2, these two verses, just to give a context before we read these two verses, the king has asked, has had a dream, and he wants somebody to tell him what the dream was and what it means. But he's not going to tell, he's not even going to give hints. If you don't do this, you're going to die. That's basically, this, this king was crazy. He did crazy things. Uh, and so here we find how Daniel and his friends handle it. In chapter 2, verse 17. Let me see if I can, got to find it here. It says, then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that was their Jewish, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that was their Jewish names. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven, and he goes on to praise. So Daniel needs this mystery revealed and his life depends on it. Their lives depend on it. So he gets his boys together. Guys, we've got to pray. We've got to pray like we've never prayed before. I'm sure, right? Imagine praying for that. And only God can reveal this, this mystery of the situation. God re is a revealer of mysteries. Uh, how does this work? There we go. Cool. Um, we see in this chapter this mystery of God and the fact that he reveals it show up all these in all these verses. And I've been thinking, I was meditating on this idea, this mystery. There's a mystery about God that we will never understand. I like God has described himself to us the best we can, he can through his word. Let me send myself in the flesh. I want to connect, but there's a part, a huge part of me you just never are going to get <laughs> because I'm God. There's a mystery that only I, I have power over. And Nebuchadnezzar was a king who loved mysteries. He had magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers in his wise men. And he's saying to them, right, I got a mystery for you. Reveal it to me, people. Can they do it? No, they cannot. They don't access the God in heaven. And so, but I, um, but Nebuchadnezzar, we, he, as you read the, the book of Daniel, you see that he's, he's a crazy king, but he's also kind of a seeker. He's looking, he's thinking like, ah, oh, I want to know. And they have all these gods, right? Which one is the real one? Who do I really turn to? Um, for the authority. And then he even thinks he's the authority. This week, you know, the world has been in awe over the mystery. I don't know if you've been following the Northern Lights, the Southern Lights. It was so cool when it first popped up, my friend in Boston posted something. And then the next day, my friend in Christchurch, put, and I was like, wait, what's happening here? Um, but it got me thinking a lot. I was, I was like, man, stink, I'm in Sydney. It's too bright. <laughs> Um, but imagine back in the day when this, like now we know, okay, this is a geomagnetic storm, whatever that means. Maybe some of you know what that means. But um, imagine back in the day when this would happen. What did they think? 
Because the Bible says the stars speak every language. You know that anytime you look up to the stars in the universe, you can't think, okay, there's a creator out there. There's, there's God. Like you really um, think about that. And uh, I've been reflecting on just the mystery of God, how he's for, for centuries been trying to communicate to us even through his creation. So I started researching when was the first recorded um, recorded northern southern lights and guess what i found i had goosebumps it was um the the earliest datable recording of the northern lights was in the 37th year of nebuchadnezzar's reign it was his astrologer and this is the the proof of the writing of it they didn't know what it was what they didn't know it was a geomagnetic storm back then but this is the first recording of it um, and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm studying, I'm thinking about Nebuchadnezzar all week. <laughs> and then I'm thinking about these, these lights from the sky and I've suddenly felt closer to Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> like he also, and his people were trying to, the mysteries of the universe. And you see that through the text, but God is the only one that reveals mysteries, the true mysteries. And this is the God we pray to. Prayer is no small thing. I don't know. Put up your hand if you can kind of minimize prayer where you're like, absolutely, right? Like, I don't know if you have those prayers. You're like, oh, I don't even know what to say today. <laughs> or just, here's a quick one. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's not, we don't always have these. And then you have the life-changing prayers that you always remember. Um, but it is incense to God. These prayers, who we're talking to is the God who reveals mysteries. What mysteries do you need to have revealed? You know, in our um, relationships, oh, going back to the prayer life, um, our friends, our sisters come with us to us with problems, right? They share the things going on, the fires going on in our lives. And you, and you want to give them spiritual advice but you just don't know. <laughs> you don't know the answers. You can think of this verse and that verse, but really you don't have the solutions. Maybe there's a really difficult family situation. Um, mental health struggles can be really intense. Um, perhaps you're just trying to help a friend become a Christian and you're like, I just can't get them to see it. <laughs> they get it. It's like they're reading the Bible with their eyes like half open, you know? Um, and I, I love the part in helping someone become a Christian that they go from reading it like this and they come back and I always, I call it God's magic happens <laughs> because they come back and they're like, I was reading this and oh my goodness. And they get it. And there was nothing I, I've been studying with this person for months and I've been saying all these things, but they needed to go before the Lord themselves and have the mystery revealed. Even just this week, I had a girl, she's been studying, she's a really like one of these really good girls and everything she's been saying in the Bible is like, you're not good. You're not saved. You're not right with God. And it's just, she's like, I get what you're saying. I get what it's saying. But I've thought this way since I was three about myself. Like, I just can't. And I can't open her eyes for her. Like, she has to go away with God and be still and read and get the mystery. And her eyes opened. And only prayer and getting on our knees can answer our questions and give us answers. Create a path for me, God. Show me where it is. Um, so let us not take prayer lightly. Yeah. Let it not be the last thing. You, oh, maybe have you tried praying about it? Sometimes it's the last thing we say. But really, let it be the first thing, the precursor. And use this retreat as a time of prayer. What can I pray for you for? And really think about what you're saying when you say that. Um, let me write it down and pray for you for guidance in that. Um, let's look at these other four, uh, or other two ways that the four friends in Daniel have fireproof relationships. Uh, sorry, it's a little slow. <laughs> Courage. Okay, these guys were representing 18,000 Jews who had been exiled in the government under the Nebuchadnezzar and the other kings and all their idols and their practices. So they, it took courage for them to not want to lose their identity as God's people. 
They wanted to represent God and hold on to their faith. And I'm sure they felt the pressure of that. So you can see in Daniel chapter 2, he, they don't eat the king's diet. They wanted to keep a coat. This is the first. I call this like the warm-up test, you know, that they were going to go through. Uh, will we stand out? Okay, God will help us still be healthy even when we obey his, his diet. Then in chapter 3, they refused to bow down to an idol and worship. And their life depended on that or be thrown into a furnace. And then Daniel refuses to pray to the king himself and he gets thrown into the lion's den. So the Jews were looking to them for example. What does it mean to remain true to God at all cost? But these guys, I really believe they could do it because they were together. They banded together in courage. You know, if you've ever gone out sharing your faith or doing anything courageous for God, if you have a friend, it makes all the world a difference. If someone looks at you like you're crazy, why are you stopping me? Or, well, at least I got my friend here. I'm, I'm not alone. And I've got a lot, of, a lot of us behind us who aren't here. We feel we have courage. Um, and I'm sure many of them, of the Jews, were giving in. I was thinking about like, I wonder if they had thought, um, these guys, like we could pray, we could bow down, but not pray, you know, like it would save our lives and we could still do great things for God. Like how did, why did they, did they have these thoughts? But they went the extra courage. Like I'm going to be bold. I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to let the officials know. I actually don't mind if they see us or not. I'm going to let them know we're not going to eat their food. And I'm not going to let car, like uh, my fear, because sometimes I tr I, I'm courageous, but then there's still fear attached to it. So I'm like half courageous. <laughs> oh, I've only got this much of faith or courage to do. Um, rather than let me go all in. And I don't know if you've ever uh, lived in a way where you're afraid to stand out. Maybe in your family, maybe at work, maybe at uni, maybe with the other school mums. We're, fill in the blank your situation but that feeling of living in fear is a horrible feeling um it reminds me of my high school days actually it's because i was baptized at age 13 and then when i was about 15 we moved to america and i felt like i was thrown into like beverly hills 90210 tv show like <laughs> in the 90s and um yeah, it was, I, I just did not belong. And then I also was a disciple. So I also, you know, you stand out just because you're a disciple. But then I'm here, this Aussie girl. Um, and I, you know, tried to build friendships, all that, the whole transition of moving countries. And by year 11, I just had felt a bit uh, beaten down socially. I had been sharing the faith with friends. Nobody was really coming out. But I got to the point where it was the break in between classes and I would go hide in the bathroom stall. Um, and then at lunchtime, uh, I would go eat my lunch in the library by myself. And I just started to slow, slowly isolate myself more and more. And then I would come home crying. <laughs> I hate this. I can't do this to my mom. And I think my mom, after a while, was like, I don't even know what to do with her. And she, she obviously, I put pieces together later. She was sharing it with her discipler. So one day her disciple had took me for a drive and she rebuked me. <laughs> she said, your mom is there for you to cry on her shoulder, but I'm here to kick your butt. That's what she told me. And I was like, what? <laughs> She's like, you are acting like you're a loser and you are not a loser. That is Satan in your head. What are you doing, Meekin? Wake up. <laughs> and I was like, dang. <laughs> It was not, you know, I'd, had, I'd been kind of coddled, like, oh, that is really hard and all this stuff. But it was exactly what I needed. I was like, she is right. Like, Satan is in my, like, he's living in my head. So the very next day, I was like, I'm going to walk into school with my head high. Like, I've got to stop this. And so I did. But then I decided, I'm like, oh, okay. Okay. And I can still feel the fear in my stomach, like when I think about it, you know, like your, your high school days. And then I decided I've got to do something that I'm scared of, like at school. What is it? Okay, I just got to get out. I'm going to run for an office, like a election 
thing in the school. And this was just like to, it's just to face fear, that's it. <laughs> I'm tired of hiding, I'm just gonna run for it. And, and that's all it was in my mind. So I, I decided to use my Aussie and made it cool instead of being ashamed of it, my accent, because you know, they love the accent. And um, I won the election. And I was like, what? <laughs> they didn't even know who I was. Um, I ended up in the leadership class after that. And, um, and then, so that was the end of year 11. So year 12, I'm like, right, there's gonna be a different year. And um, I started studying the Bible with my best friend. And she, her mom forbid her for studying the Bible. So we secretly in the car before school studied the Bible. Um, and she got to the point where she's, I'm going to rebel against my parents and get baptized. And she ran out of the house one day to get baptized. And they said they were going to kick her out and they never did. And she is faithful to this day, my, my friend Morale. And um, because now I had a friend uh, and then I was in this leadership class uh, and then uh, one of the leaders, the student leaders were like, we're going to have a school pageant and we need some more contestants. So like, Megan, will you be in the pageant? And I was like, no, <laughs> I'm not a pageant person. And look how short I am. Like, really? No. But, and he's like, we just, uh, I'm not going to take it that serious. Okay, please just be in it. All right, fine. Well, then I find out there's a swimsuit competition. Oh. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> um, and so I decided to wear like a wetsuit and carry a surfboard and be an Aussie girl, Aussie surf girl. Um, because I was, but I didn't realize that I would, everyone was in a bikini except for me. <laughs> and all my whole teen ministry came to support me that night. And guess what? I won the pageant. Yes. Um, and it was, I look back and like, it was like this victory. I feel like God was just like, I'm going to encourage you <laughs> because you're being courageous. You know, like I ended up from hiding in the bathrooms to being the queen at the school. And, um, and then we got this women's Bible study going in my school. My dreams were coming true. And I all, I look back at those days and I'm like, it's just because somebody rebuked me and I took steps of faith. Like it's who can create that except for who can give that to you except for God. Um, and, and then all the fruit of that since then, like there was, it just kept going through my life because morale, my best friend, she married day's best friend, two weeks apart. We had three kids. Yeah. It just was, we went on a mission team together, but I can relate to these guys, not, I didn't walk through fire. I haven't been thrown to the lions, unless you consider high school the lion den. But, but being together and with someone, having courage, it's just like let, God does amazing things. And so let's band together in courage. Um, how can we stand out? Because St. Corinthians says we're supposed to be ambassadors for Christ, right? And uh, even just having pure, a pure dating relationship, your worldly friends are like, that's weird. Are you not going to live with him before you get married? Are you not going to try? Th How do you know if you're compatible? I mean, I heard this a million times when I was single. Yeah, that's what the world says, but we, we're going to stand out in courage and it works. People in the world end up actually being jealous, wanting, wishing they could have what you have. Parenting, prioritizing God and the church over activities. That's just weird. Why would you do that? I've even lost worldly mum friends over that. Using our money for retreats and tithing and missions and all these things. Like, well, why are you doing that? It's standing out. Have courage. Have courage to go the extra mile. But it's all these small decisions that can lead to the big decisions in our life of having courage. Um, so finally, let's look at that, the third, uh, area of fireproof, fireproof faith. And let's read Daniel chapter three together. The test of all tests for these guys. Okay. Let's find it here. Fireproof faith. All right. You know what? I'm going to get my glasses. <laughs> Yeah. 
Oh, thanks, guys. Yeah. They're just from the, you know, pharmacy, but. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because I can read a little bit, but the whole chapter, I need my glasses. Okay, number, verse one of chapter three. Best, I, it's possibly the best story in the whole Bible. King, I don't know, I think. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 60, or six cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satra satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of God, that of gold, sorry, not God, that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers, they're the ones that, you know, saw the lights, came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has dec issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, a uh, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown to a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They, ser they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so um, urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw them in the fire? Yet yeah. they replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. That's crazy. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be 
to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's commands and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other god can save this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Wow. That is crazy story. And this king is crazy. He wants to cut people up. He switches from, from uh, you know, God to God. Who, and you would think, oh, now he believes. Well, if you keep reading the, the book, he, he reneges on that. Um, so I'm imagining these guys before like, okay, oh, no. The edict is we have to bow down to this idol. What are we going to do? And they huddle together. Oh, maybe we should just do it secretly. Maybe we should be bold. Maybe we should, okay, let's have faith. Let's just have faith together and let's do it together. Uh, maybe we won't even be caught. But they were, record, they were caught, weren't they? And they had great faith. The ultimate moment of their test of, of verse 16, and this is the part where I love, we don't need to defend ourselves to you. The God of heaven is able to save us. But even if he does not, we will not bow down. Their faith was not contingent on what God would do. It was based on God alone and who he is and their faith in him. So many times our faith can be like Nebuchadnezzar. I believe, I see, and then, oh gosh, now, now I'm going to worship over here. But these guys are determined no matter what happens. We serve a God that, can, he, that created the world. That you're a king now because, and because God has put you there. <laughs> we respect you because they still say your majesty and they give him respect, but they don't put him above God. Yeah. And when we are faithful to God, the, he the world can heat up more around us. The pressure of the world can feel stronger. But you know what happens when we stick together and are faithful? Jesus shows up. Yeah. I love this in this passage. It's most likely Jesus walking around in the fire with them. You know, Paul says when he, because he's preaching repentance, that's why they wanted to arrest him and kill him. Repentance isn't popular. And I don't know about you. I'm in a, the business of studying the Bible with lots of people. And so I get to see it more regularly that there's this illusion of Christianity out there that people are not called to repentance in, in the Christian world for the most part. I'm not saying everywhere, but from my experience of people coming from other churches, they're just not taught how to change. They're not called out on their sin and it's not popular to it. And it narrows the gate. But that's, we didn't write it. <laughs> it's in the Bible. And I'm quite amazed how often people are not called to the scriptures in the Christian world. Just this week, I studied the Bible with a married woman. She actually has breast cancer and um, is still going through the process. And she's like, I want to learn about Jesus. She asked her Christian friend. She said, her friend said, watch The Chosen. You'll learn all about Jesus. So she watched both seasons, every episode, she can like quote the episode. And then she had her um, chemo in a, it's like a religious hospital. And they, she's like, I'm trying to learn about Jesus. Are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm Christian. Oh, the woman who started this hospital wrote a book on Jesus. Read this book on Jesus. She read the whole book on Jesus. Not one person has told her to read the Bible. <laughs> And it's crazy. And I don't think those, those people meant, mean well who are helping her, you know. But we had our first Bible study this week. I'm like, have you ever read a gospel? What's a gospel? I'm like, oh, she doesn't know anything about the Bible, but she's, she's seeking. And then we talked to her about reading Mark. She's like, thank you so much. Um, and so what we have, what we're teaching people, I told the sister who brought her out and it's her friend that we're studying with. I'm like, these Bible studies are revolutionary. To us, we get used to them. They're simple. You know, they're things we do. It is revolutionary to people out there and even in the Christian world. 
But the more we call people to repentance, we've got to expect pushback. We've got to expect the fire on the outside to feel hotter. Turn it up. Satan will turn it up seven times more. And times of testing will come in our faith. But together we can pass these tests. Together our relationships can be strong. Where we're calling each other out. Let's do this together. Come on, let's have faith. Be courageous. Um, I want to share about my friends, the Gabukans. Uh, this is the this family. We met them in New Zealand. Uh, when we moved there, they had moved to Christchurch where there was no church and they were crying all the time. We made a terrible decision um, because we left Philippines and moved where there's no church. But in faith, they moved to Auckland without jobs. They put God first, repented, and they became over the 10 years, last 10 years, one of our closest friends, their family. Um, and last year was one of the hardest years I've ever seen them go through. He, he lost his job and she was working two jobs to, to keep the, the bills going. Um, and then uh, the kids were going through struggles and then his mom was in hospital uh, in Philippines that he had to keep going back and forth. And then his sister who married a disciple, he was uh, not a good guy, fell away and ended up um, being in corruption stuff. And the, his sister, this brother's sister, who was a disciple but fell away, she got framed and ended up being in jail. And I don't know if you know much about Filipino jails, but they're like sardines in these little like cages kind of thing. And so she's in there and they're going through all this last year. And we're in New Zealand. It feels like a world away too. Far. And I'm like, what was happening? I don't know the answers. I don't know the mysteries of what God is trying to do in your life. But let's have faith. Let's pray. This is all we can do is let me hold up your arms while you stand. This is the test of your, your lives. Um, and in the end, they uh, kept seeking God first and begging God in all these ways. But particularly in their sister, the sister starts to repent in jail. And she starts teaching the inmates the Bible. Um, and she, it looked like she could be in there forever. We weren't sh sure. And finally, one day, this woman comes, who's the one that framed her, crying at the jail and said, I'm so sorry, and released her from the um, court case or whatever. And she was set free and has now been restored. And um, she has two kids and she's back with her kids. And, got, and now she's helping all these people become Christians. <laughs> And, and around this time, um, Carlos got a job. Where was his job? In Sydney. At the same time, we're moving to Sydney. Literally the same time. So they're in the North region with us still. <laughs> and they shared this story uh, for communion like a couple of weeks ago in the North. And people didn't know. Like they thought this family has it all together. Like, whoa, what they've gone through. But it really showed me, man, I don't have all the answers to help people. <laughs> I can't fix things only God can but what is my role what is your role in each other's lives it is to call each other to faith to trust God through the tests of the lifetime to have fireproof relationships if I know women's ministry there is drama among you there are relationship issues there are hurt feelings um but remember, always remember, the fire in the world is way worse than the fires inside. It will, the world will chew you up and spit you back out. And hopefully you'd have enough humility to come back if you do. Don't, go, don't leave. <laughs> Stay together, work it out, figure it out. What is God trying to teach you? And maybe through the fires inside, those are the things that are going to get us to heaven in the end. Um, and grow through the tests. So who among you, who among your sisters are being tested? Who needs your prayers? Who do you need to lift up their arms in support? Are you holding each other's arms up at the same time? Um, but when we focus on strengthening each other, helping each other get to heaven, the perspective of conflict changes. Yeah. These guys, it doesn't even talk about their differences. The, the book of Daniel only talks about their commonalities. You bet they, I'm sure they were completely different. I bet they were, they, did they wrestle each other? These are young boys, teenage boys. 
you know, they, they would have been different, but God bonded them together and was stronger than anything else. And that's what we have in the sisterhood, in our relationships. It is amazing that we get to have fireproof relationships that can pass fire tests with God. Um, and to call each other to, the, to faith until we die. That's what we're called to do. Like recently I went to LA for a leaders meeting and I saw my campus minister woman there. I was, I apologized to her from my, my 18 year old self. She didn't remember so much grace, but she, we had lunch together and she told me her mom became a Christian and then her mom eventually was on her deathbed and they were planning her mom's funeral before she died. And her mom was involved in it. And they talked about having her sister come to the funeral. And her mom was like, no, she's not allowed to come to my funeral. <laughs> and Misha, um, Misha rebuked her mom on her deathbed. Mom, you are almost there. Don't blow it now. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh man, I love this. Because if someone rebukes me on my deathbed, thank you. <laughs> You know, like if I need it, even then give it to me so I can make it all the way. She's like, you did not come this far, mom, to blow it now in planning your funeral and her bitterness to your sister. And her mom did repent. Her sister came to the funeral and she passed away. She's in heaven. But it made me that gave me this perspective recently, like this is till the end. And we are in it together. We are getting each other through the fires with God to heaven. Let's have five proof relationship sisters in bond together. Awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. That was amazing. Um, well, as you all know, it's already 11 o'clock. So uh, that is the end of the women's lesson. We'll be meeting back here at 1.30 for hopefully Olympics outside. The weather is though forecast to rain. So be prepared to be outside, maybe get dirty and a little wet, or be inside and we'll uh, change change tactics a little bit and have something in here to stay dry. But we'll just keep an eye on the on the weather and um, yeah, see you back here at one thirty.